Australia, this is your new Prime Minister. Tony Abbott has officially become our 28th Prime Minister. Leadership changes, especially in government, leave serious scar tissue. And many people never get over such a thing. Australia has its 29th Prime Minister. Malcolm Turnbull was today sworn in after toppling Tony Abbott in a late night coup. Politics is a team game. So when you've decided that you're going to change the captain, it's a very big deal. Scott Morrison is tonight set to become Australia's 30th Prime Minister after a dramatic day in the Liberal Party room. Friendships are broken, people tell each other lies, and look, it's very deeply traumatising. So just put the slate on, take one. Scott Morrison, why did you want to run for federal politics? Service. Well, Malcolm Turnbull, why so determined to enter politics? It was genuinely a commitment to public service. To my party, which has given me the privilege to serve my heartfelt thanks. In looking at the nine years in power and our three prime ministers, the playing of politics was always the number one game, number two game, and number three game. It's not productive and it's not edifying. The prime ministership of this country is not a prize or a plaything. When enmity, when ambition, and when distrust take hold, it can be very damaging. This is my leader. There you go. And I'm ambitious for him. While that internal war was going on, it was like being strapped to a suicide bomber. Something horrific and catastrophic was going to happen. You can see it coming. You wish they wouldn't do it, uh, but they do it anyway. Simon, you're ready to go? Okay, all okay, good. here we go. What one word springs to mind when I say the name Tony Abbott? Determination. Strong. Indefatigable. Energy. Negative. Negativity. Clever. Honest. Uh, for me, it's dishonest. Oh, robust. Aggressive. Hey, courageous. Leader. Team player. Tenacious. Relentless. Disciplined. Conservative. Genuine. The word that springs to mind is, you yeah, nice guy. Pugilistic can give you a hug. Ah, a good law bloke. Decent. A decent guy. <laughs> Humanity. Vocation. Um, Enigma. Obviously, uh, uh, it's been uh, a big day for me. 
Uh, it's been a tough day uh, for some of my colleagues. When Tony Abbott took over the leadership of the Liberal Party, we were at a low point. Uh, we had lost direction, and Tony Abbott, albeit getting the leadership by one vote, soon galvanised the team because he was absolutely relentless in keeping the government to account. Don't yawn, Prime Minister. Answer the question. Don't stare at your notes. Listen. Tony was a brilliant opposition leader. He, he stuck to a message and he was just merciless in how he applied it. He picked up a brick and he just went after the Labor Party. These are people's lives at stake and you show no remorse, you show no concern about anything except saving your own hide. Yeah. Tony had come very close in 2010 to winning that election. Congratulations. Labor limped to the magic number of 76 with the backing of just two of the three country independents. So he was very focused on doing absolutely everything that was needed to be done to make sure that we were going to win in 2013. The Prime Minister, six days before the election, stood up before the Australian people and she said... Uh, there will be no carbon tax under the government island. He spent three years uh, on the attack against Julie Gillard. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Yeah. And then Labor panicked and put Kevin Rudd back in uh, at the last minute. The Prime Minister Kevin Rudd has ended weeks of speculation by naming the first Saturday in September as the date for the federal election. The time has come for the Australian people to decide on our nation's future. I am ready. My team is ready. You've watched us for three years. Well, Tony Abbott is focused on his mission, which is generally one of destruction, to defeat something, to stop something. And he always boils it down to some crisp slogans and, like a Dalek, goes out and says the same thing again and again. We will scrap the carbon tax, we will get the budget back into the black, we will build the roads of the 21st century and we will stop the boats. I remember the world was telling me that Abbott was unelectable, Captain Catholic, unelectable, no chance, forget it. And I was in the street in Melbourne and met an old friend and Labor, strong Labor operative, and he said, he's killing us, Russell. I said, what are you talking about? And look at the polls, he said, he's killing us. He's one line us, I'm gonna stop the boats. I'm gonna dump, dump. The four things he kept saying. Stop the boats. Stop the boats. You know, stop the boats. Repair the budget. Stopping the boats, removing the carbon tax. People in three words understood exactly what he would do. Pay back the debt, stop the boats. Stop the boats. Uh, stop the taxes. Pretty much it. I will scrap the carbon tax, scrap the mining tax, end the waste, cut red tape. We'll build a stronger economy, stop the boats, stop the boats, and build the roads of the 21st century. Bang, 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 bang. And he just bashed it and bashed it and bashed it. Didn't matter what you asked him, that's what he did. Stop the boats. Clearly it was a, a very strong uh, victory, uh, uh, 90 seats, one of the most emphatic election results of the last 50 years. And from today, I declare that Australia is under new management and that Australia is once more open for business. One of the most important things in politics when you 
go from opposition into government is that the, the leader has got to manage the transition. There are different skills needed to govern. I think Tony's difficulty once he got there, he didn't make the transition uh, as effectively as others have done and you are required to do. Mr Abbott unveiled his front bench lineup this morning, although he's been criticised for including only one woman in Cabinet. The only woman in the Cabinet, apparently, of 20. This has many people asking questions. Where are the capable coalition women? So after our election win, we had a dinner here in Canberra, and it was, a, it was really the inner sanctum. And yes, somebody did raise the issue about only one woman, Julie Bishop, being in the Cabinet. And look, Tony Abbott, as the new Prime Minister, he took very badly uh, to being given that advice. So thank you so much, colleagues. I think it said to all of us that women weren't really valued enough to uh, be selected into the Ministry and in particular into Cabinet. Um, it certainly didn't send the right message. Plainly, I am disappointed that there are not at least two women in the Cabinet. Nevertheless, there are some very good and talented women um, knocking on the door of the Cabinet. Did it send a message that it was a very masculine environment? Well, it was a very masculine environment and uh, I think, as we know, in any workplace, uh, if you have a workplace full of men, and in particularly in the environment of politics, it gets um, very testosterone-y very quickly. When I first started at Parliament, the level of alcohol um, in, in the building was beyond anything that I had ever seen. I mean, it was a workplace. A lot of it was the males that would get together in each other's offices. Now, that meant that a lot of things were discussed, talked about, strategised, um, without the women even being part of those discussions. Looking back, I can see that the absence of women other than Julie in the Cabinet at the time and the commentary around that of course was a symptom of problems that were to come to dog us more fundamentally in an electoral sense in years to come and to this very day. Well, the mood's very jubilant. I mean, we saw ourselves as bringing back some stability and order to federal politics you know, after the chaotic period of, of the Rudd-Gillard-Rudd government and the adults being back in charge, which was the line that was often used. Madam Speaker, the election was a referendum on the carbon tax. The people have spoken. They want it gone. He absolutely hit the ground running. There's no doubt about that, and, and he went hard. But it was absolutely relentlessly focused on implementing the things he'd promised at that election. Today, the useless, destructive tax that you voted to get rid of is finally gone. He took out the carbon tax and the mining tax very quickly. We saw the boats being stopped. Stopping the boats was very important. The situation seemed to be out of control. Scott Morrison had, uh, in opposition, developed uh, this policy proposal called Operation Sovereign Borders. Operation Sovereign Borders is the government's response to stopping the flow of illegal boat arrivals to Australia that commenced and occurred under the previous government and sadly led to more than 1,100 deaths at sea. There are no simple answers to a border crisis and not all of your solutions will be popular. Probably the least popular was turning boats back. But I knew it was, without it, it could not succeed. Confirmation of the latest turn back emerged hours after the United Nations Committee Against Torture in Geneva slammed Australia's treatment of asylum seekers. The world is watching in horror of how Australia is treating vulnerable people who are fleeing war. Oh, Scott Morrison did an incredible job. Uh, you, you look at 
what people thought, right? They thought there's no way you can do this, there's no way it'll work. Uh, and yet it did work, it worked in a really short period of time. Own future ministerial ambitions. And while Scott Morrison... What was your analysis of Scott Morrison's performance as Minister for Immigration and Border Protection? Harsh, calculating and political. There was no compassion in my view or consideration at all uh, for them as human beings. Do you think he had ambitions at that point? Everything was calculated to becoming Prime Minister. Well hidden. Scott was, like all politicians, ambitious from the start. I think he saw this as an opportunity to shine um, and to give him his credit, he did. Thank you very much. Uh, I do think that he was also thinking, well, this gives me political prominence and sets me up later on pretty well, and uh, that's also politics. Tony, well, he's very bright and hard-working uh, and can be tremendously fun. I played a couple of halves of rugby for uh, Manly on the, on the weekend and it uh, wasn't so great for the facial good looks, but... Uh... But he's also, in some ways, rough and ready, which kind of grates, in some respects, against his more sophisticated, Jesuitical, academic... Oxford University graduate, so I think he's a, a great conundrum. He's a Rhodes Scholar, a boxing champion, a monarchist, and now the new boy in the Federal Liberal Party. Hi, Robert. Hi, Robert. Hi, Robert. Good to see you. Nicknamed the Mad Monk, Mr Abbott remains a staunch Catholic and defender of traditional family values. If uh, he ever got to that position, I think he'd make a very fine Prime Minister. Tony is a person who's incredibly intelligent at times. I, uh, my own personal view is, is people have three quadrants of their brain. They have academic intelligence, social intelligence and sporting intelligence. Well, Tony's brain here, a lot of the intelligence stuff, crowded out a bit of a social IQ. <laughs> <laughs> and I work on an adult sex line to make ends meet. Tony's clunky, his character's clunky. I mean, this is a guy, you know, could you describe him as charismatic? Yes, he's, he's clearly articulate and all that, but, he's, but he's, he's not smooth. No one, however smart, however experienced, is the suppository of all wisdom. <laughs> and I think that um, Canada, Canada... Um... OK, well, tell me, what's the context? And if it's out of context, what is the context? You're not saying anything, Tony. If we could get a knife and cut one. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> yeah, you know, eating the onion. That wasn't a dare, Prime Minister. You had a, you had a Believe you me, there are a lot of stuff that ever made the media which is vastly more eccentric than that. Oh, we're so glad to have you today. Thank you for coming. That's great. Hi, Peter. <laughs> Credlin helped in that, and things that Tony might have thought were funny, it, Peter would say, please do not say that in public. Well, clearly, Peter Credlin was a very influential part of the government, which is very unusual for an unelected person, and, and it is unusual for a chief of staff to have that level of profile. I'm proud of my chief of staff, Peter Credlin, who does an extraordinary job uh, as, uh, uh, in some ways, uh, the de facto deputy leader. She was a player. She was in the room. She had a lot of opinions, and you knew what they were. So she was uh, in the discussion in a way that I haven't seen other chiefs of staff in my time. Other ministers, you could see from the looks on their faces that they didn't always welcome her input into decision-making. But it is also fair to say they all listened to her. I've never known a person in a leadership position as dominated by another as Tony Abbott was by Peter Credlin. Peter was a gatekeeper. It was a major issue. And I know backbenchers were totally cheesed off 
uh, with Tony not being accessible, having to go to Peter first and then Tony. I say this as a person that has a deep respect for Peter Credlin. Her interpersonal skills were suboptimal from time to time and that occasioned unnecessary discontent amongst her colleagues. Ms Credlin has been criticised for overstepping the mark in dressing down backbenchers and ministers alike. This example, reading the Riot Act to now Minister Stuart Robert, caught by our cameras during the last election campaign. Do you think she's been demonised? Of course she's been demonised. Hmm. A powerful woman in Australia is still an unusual thing to a lot of people. Do you really think that uh, my Chief of Staff would be under this kind of criticism if her name was P-E-T-E-R as opposed to P-E-T-A? The one Peter was it's his call because he's a PM, and um, so I, I, you know, I think that's that was an issue in his prime ministership, but it it was nothing, absolutely nothing, compared to the first budget. After all the goodwill and the success, it was, you know, hundreds of pages of uh, political suicide. The 2014 budget, why did that go so wrong? Um, <laughs> Joe Hockey had too much coffee. <laughs> we are a nation of lifters, not leaners. Yeah. The age of entitlement is over. To bring in your first budget in such a sort of strong way has a sense of arrogance. We know that for some in the community, this budget will not be easy. But this budget is not about self-interest. This budget is about the national interest. In a word, ouch. The government's calling it pain with purpose and there's pain aplenty. Spending has been slashed by cutting family benefits and tightening welfare rules. The deepest cuts are to health and education. A whole lot of policy got dumped that night. The cabinet had not been consulted at any stage, which is just unforgivable. There were colleagues who were crying they were crying because they were saying, how can I sell, how can I explain this to people? It had some good things in it, uh, like the Medical Research Future Fund, the defence spending, but it also had a lot of controversial measures in it with respect to pensions, bulk billing, unemployment benefits, and ultimately that was too much for the public to embrace at one time. We must always remember that when one person receives an entitlement from the government, it comes out of the pocket of another Australian. I think Joe Hockey thought this was really the chance to end what he perceived and others in the Liberal Party as a period of handouts, you know, almost a bit of um, dull bludges are dull bludges by definition, right? And then there was Joe Hockey and Matthias Coleman with their cigars, which were, they were congratulating themselves on bringing down a budget, which in the public perception was exceptionally harsh. <laughs> Seriously, did you have to do that where you could be seen? We cannot go on paying our mortgage on the credit card. And the country, I think, was ready to uh, tackle some reform. It was not as well executed as it could have been. And there was a concern that commitments that had been given uh, by Tony uh, on election night were now being reversed in a very, um, very ham-fisted way. Literally hours before the polls closed, Abbott did an interview with SBS. Uh, no cuts to education, no cuts to health, no change to pensions, no change to the GST, and no cuts to the ABC or SBS. Look, SBS doesn't have a huge audience, but you know what? Everyone in Australia saw it again and again and again after the budget. Good morning, Prime Minister. Hi, Shee, good morning. Are you a bit embarrassed? that you had to break so many election promises. Uh, Koshi, this is a fundamentally honest budget. Look, um, 
Everybody that knows me knows that uh, I love Tony Abbott, but yes, I think they were things that under pressure uh, he need not have said. No cuts to health, there'd be no cuts to education, there'd be no increase in taxes, and all three of them appeared in the budget. Well, I'm not sure that that's true. So, post the budget, we're in this meeting and we go around and I felt like we were living in an alternative universe where everyone was saying, it's so fantastic, it's so great, we're going so well, you know, everything's great. And, you know, and it got to me and I very politely but honestly and directly said, well, you know, the truth is we're not living up to what we said before the election. And I said what we should kind of do is what we in Queensland call do a Peter Beattie. Now we got it wrong. The community didn't share our solution. Front up, say, this is what we've got to do. I'm, you know, I'm sorry that this is the case and, and get about fixing it, which the public really respects that honesty and directness. Uh, and unfortunately, you know, the Prime Minister, Tony Abbott, saw that as a very personal attack, had a very visceral and angry response. He sort of smashed his hands on the table and said, we can't admit that we fucking lied. There's been no fucking lies in this. And I mean, it was just a, uh, a very strange response to what was sort of a pretty clear and respectful statement of the obvious. I mean, I think I was silly enough but to stand up and say, well, look, you said there'd be no new taxes, and there is. I don't know, think he liked that that much. <laughs> I don't think he spoke to me for six months. Taking to the streets, voicing their anger about the federal budget. We had a disastrous reception back in our electorates. That had shaken a lot of people. If this is a joke, Tony Abbott and Joe Hockey, we don't do it. It's not funny. There really was a lot of phone calls happening between backbenchers saying, hey, ha how's it going where you are? It's brutal, it's cruel, it's inhuman, it's un-Australian, and uh, I'm furious. Post-budget rancour spilled onto... After the Richmond's 2014 budget, uh, the opportunity began to emerge um, for those who didn't necessarily support Tony's leadership uh, to begin to explore other options, and the only other option was Malcolm. Tony Abbott had a rival, and that was Malcolm Turnbull. As Tony often said, Malcolm didn't go into politics to serve in somebody else's government. He, he wanted the, the glittering prize of the prime ministership. Malcolm Turnbull cut his teeth as a young journalist with the Bulletin. He shifted to a legal career in 1980, but it was as a trailblazing tech investor that he made his fortune with the Australian company Aussie Mail. I suppose I first locked horns with Tony Abbott over the Republic issue. The Australian Republican movement believes that Australians should not be barred from any public office in our country, least of all that of head of state. I was the chairman of the Australian Republican movement and he was uh, the leader of Australians for constitutional monarchy and so we had plenty of debates together. You see, what makes our constitution so we're stuck works? There forever, are what, we? what makes we're stuck our... with the British monarchy forever? Is that Let... right? My turn. Does Tony Abbott dislike Malcolm Turnbull? This is a good question. I've never asked uh, Tony Abbott about that, but uh, Malcolm has this capacity. If Tony Abbott could walk on water, then Malcolm Turnbull would articulate very effectively that this was proof positive that Tony Abbott can't swim. They disliked each other. <laughs> so let's clear that one up. They disliked each other. And uh, uh, and it was hard because I liked Abbott and, you know, at the start of it, I got like, you know, along with Turnbull. And, but, and I used to bring up, I said, you've got to mend the bench, you know, mend the bridges. But it'd be like going to Fidel Castro and saying, look, you just, Reagan's not such a bad guy. You guys should, you guys should you know, go have a beer together. It's just not going to happen. I'm interested to know if you still hold to your excellent assessment of Malcolm Turnbull's quote, <laughs> arrogant, rude, obnoxious, a filthy rich merchant banker out of touch with real Australians. Well, quote. I can't remember myself ever saying anything uh, um, uh, quite as concise as that. Um, uh, Malcolm's probably said worse about me. Uh, you could see they didn't like each other. It was just... It was like two bandit roosters. Well, they were two bulls in the one paddock, and it was never um, going to be uh, an easy match. Tony Abbott is very much a centre-right. 
and Turnbull is very much a centre, some would even today say, are centre left. So I think when it did come to uh, the big policy debates, you're probably not going to have a meeting of two minds. How debilitating was that rivalry between these two men, Abbott and... I thought it was shocking. I thought, you know, I often thought we'd be better off without both of them. They were damaging the party. This was Shakespearean. You had two extremely talented men who couldn't have been more different from one another as personalities, who occupied the same inch of time in Australian political history. And because of that, they destroyed each other's governments. Seventeenth of July, 2014, MH17 is shot down by Russian-backed separatists in Ukraine. What were your thoughts on how Abbott handled that particular tragedy? I do want to assure uh, the families of those who have died that our thoughts and prayers are with them. Uh, we bleed for them, we grieve for them, and we will do everything we can to ensure that the perpetrators of this uh, are identified and as far as is humanly possible, brought to justice. Look, I thought uh, Abbott and Julie Bishop responded well to that. We have an overriding objective. I thought Julie in particular did very well. And justice for those killed on MH17. You know, she went to the UN, she got a resolution from the Security Council. Our resolution demands that armed groups in control of the crash site provide safe access immediately to allow for the recovery of the bodies. She was a very, very good foreign minister. We will not rest until we bring them home. Abbott's response was strong, but it, 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 it looked overly pugnacious. Look, I'm going to uh, shirt front, Mr Putin. Uh, you bet you are. Uh, you bet I am. Uh, I am going to... Saying you're going to shirt front the president of Russia does sound, you know, a little childish, really. International bullies need to be shirt fronted immediately because they become emboldened by each extra activity. Given that 37 Australians uh, are amongst the dead, uh, it is imperative that we get uh, a properly secure site. Uh, Tony Abbott really activated a war cabinet style of approach to the, um, to the incident. So Australia certainly prepared uh, for this, this whole incident to uh, escalate, uh, that we may need to send troops. You obviously discussed this with the Prime Minister, Tony Abbott. Can you describe what was on the table? Well, um, I got a phone call four o'clock one morning, and it seemed to me it was going to be quite a large military uh, uh, deployment. I was concerned that the military option would be provocative because the crash site was only uh, a short distance from the, uh, the Russian border. And already I was aware of a huge build-up of uh, Russian forces on the border. We had a very sensible discussion about uh, all the factors at play. Uh, and at the end of it all, he said, uh, OK, Angus, I accept your advice. It'll be a police-led option. Well, he was talked out of it by our, you know, our military leadership. You know, basically, this was a thought bubble that um, was quickly punctured. But it, it showed, if you like, the elements of Tony that started to make me feel that we had a very dangerous prime minister. And nowhere more so 
than in the way Tony Abbott was talking about terrorism. This is the grim reality that the world faces now as far as the Daesh death cult is concerned. It's coming after us. Earlier this morning, a joint New South Wales police counterterrorism operation took place. Uh, police believe that this group had the intention to commit violent acts here in Australia. What appears to be a hostage situation unfolds at the Lynn Cafe on Martin Place. A black flag with white Arabic writing was being waved behind the hostages. He was amping up the rhetoric in a way that was calculated to frighten people. We have been saved from an imminent terrorist attack inspired by the Islamist death cult, which is now stalking so much of the Middle East. He would do press conferences, not just with generals and admirals, but with more and more flags. I think the highest number we got to was 10, five on each side. It was, it, it was right over the top. Some time ago, we raised the threat level from medium to high, uh, and that, regrettably, uh, means that uh, attacks are expected. Because Every decision that Tony Abbott made in relation to national security was informed by the advice of the national security agencies. Now, I understand some you know, people might quibble about some of the rhetoric uh, that Tony used, um, but in terms of decision-making, uh, the decisions were always professionally informed. Look, I think from my conversations with Tony, he clearly understood what he was against. But, I mean, there were many occasions when I said to him, um, what is your vision for Australia and where do you want to take the country? And he treated that as a trick question almost and did struggle to answer that question, which uh, I think for me was a very disappointing situation because fantastic to have the clear sense of what you were against. But you do, as Prime Minister, I think, have to have a sense of what you are for and where you want to take the country. You know, I was very positive about Tony. I thought he was a very authentic guy. <laughs> and, you know, from a conservative perspective, uh, he was certainly my guy. There was no doubt about it. Good morning, kids. How are you? Looking forward to a nice day at school, are you? He was a guy that lived and breathed the mission and uh, to make this country a better place. <laughs> While others talk about uh, Indigenous uh, issues, he was the guy that was out there a week a year working in Indigenous communities, and that wasn't just leading up to elections. That was for years and years. Tony certainly had fire in his belly. He certainly had drive and he had a passion. And Indigenous issues uh, had a singular ambition to try and improve things, but not through consultation, co-design or co-deciding with Aboriginal people. It was Tony's way. If you want to close the gap, what you've got to do is get the kids to school, the adults to work. If people choose to live where there's no jobs, fine, by all means live in a remote location, but there's a limit to what you can expect the state to do for you if you want to live there. Well, it was a challenge being an Indigenous person in the Coalition Government, and I even had a couple of staff say, you're our token Aboriginal. It is with deep and mixed emotion that I, as an Aboriginal man with Noongar, Yamaji and Wongai heritage, stand before you and the members of the House of Representatives as an equal. I want to reflect these... What frustrated me is I'd had all this experience in health, education, land issues, uh, and in whole of government approaches, including the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths and Custody. And when meetings occurred, I was never invited to participate or give feedback into those because I was a first termer. And so I was on the outer in Indigenous issues. And I used to hate the missionary approach in the way that we did things under Tony. He couldn't see the value of doing some things differently doing things with Aboriginal people, not to them.
by the end of 2014, Abbott was not travelling well in the opinion polls. While Mr Abbott acknowledges polling today shows he and the government are on the nose, he's trying to sound positive. This is not the first government to have a rough patch in the polls. So the Turnbull supporters, I think, were already well and truly on manoeuvres. Once we started losing news poll after news poll, uh, that was when Malcolm was able to quietly slip in um, and basically start that narrative that under an Abbott-led government, we probably wouldn't be successful. There's a news poll out today which is not good news for the government. It was clear that barring some miraculous turnaround, we were headed for a very ignominious one-term government with Tony as a leader. It does seem that the Abbott government is struggling. Yes, it does, and Newspol has a 10-point lead to Labor, but that dovetails with Morgan. Scott was keen to, to get moving against Abbott. We had a series of meetings around that period. He was very concerned about Abbott's prospects. I don't know whether he shared all of my concerns, but he, look, Scott is a, st a former state director, right? He is a very professional political tactician, and he can count. Malcolm Turnbull told me, and I'll quote him, he was very concerned about Abbott's prospects. So Scott was keen to get moving against Abbott. What do you say to that? No, I don't think I'd agree with the conclusion. You know, people have discussions but can take away different conclusions. Um, we were in a difficult spot at that time. And, you know, there were assessments that things were not travelling well for us. The 14-15 budget hadn't gone well. And we needed to turn things around. That's what we needed to do. And uh, I was keen to sort of deal with that in the Cabinet. Scott would have liked me to challenge Abbott and fail. Look, I, I know, listen, I know the guy, right? I know, I've known him for years. I know how he operates. Scott's dream sequence was, his first dream sequence was for me to challenge Abbott, to lose, to be discredited as the disruptor, the challenger, and then when Abbott continued to underperform, for Scott to come through the middle. As the, as the compromise candidate. I was resisting the uh, invitations to um, climb over the top of the trench and charge. Because I could, I could see what that agenda was. Turnbull says that you were encouraging him to run. Tell me your version of events. Oh, well, I think I already have. You weren't encouraging him to run? We shared a view that the government needed to turn things around. Malcolm was a very enthusiastic um, candidate. <laughs> Well, at the beginning of 2015, everyone's always cheerful at the beginning of the year. It's Australia, so it's summer. I knew that there was tension, you know, in the party room with certain people, of course, but I thought that would all be, that would dissipate until, of course, Australia Day. I was uh, on my way to my first citizenship ceremony and to my horror, at about 7.45, the news came over the radio that we'd made Prince Philip a knight on Australia Day. And I, I won't say what I said, because it was on television, but I thought, this is going to be a really bad day. I'm really pleased that the Queen has seen fit to award knighthoods in the Order of Australia to Prince Philip. Prince Philip. Oh, God. Yeah, that was a shocker. <laughs> I thought it was a, a fake news. I thought it was a, a gag. He was 
at least on this occasion, quite crackers. A warning, Will Robinson, warning, danger, danger. His pick brought ridicule, disbelief and isolation. This was not uh, a decision of the government, it was a decision uh, of uh, the Prime Minister. Tony Abbott was very honest about the fact that this was a captain's pick. It's Australia Day, we're not a bunch of tossers, let's get it right. I thought it was a terrible decision. It seemed to me to be very out of tune with, uh, with what uh, the rest of the members of the government thought and, uh, frankly, the Australian people. Every city's paper flayed Tony Abbott's decision to give Prince Philip a knighthood. People were in the car park yelling at me about <laughs> knights and dames and what on earth do you think you're doing? This is where you, you, you press off on your mobile phone and, and jump down a wombat hole. <laughs> This is something that never cost anyone's job, never cost any money, but it's the one thing I think that more than anything that actually set more people against Tony because they thought his radar was broken. Really? Giving an honour to Prince Philip, supposed to be the undermining of a Prime Minister? Talk about first world problems. What it really was, was certain people yet again wanting to find any opportunity to undermine Prime Minister Abbott. And we got sidetracked on whether or not somebody got a knighthood. So what? Australia Day 2015 was the straw that broke the camel's back for me personally. Yeah, I guess for many of us, um, that is the moment where uh, we, we just thought, this has got to stop. What are we going to have thrown upon us next time? I basically stepped from being uh, a forgiver of these issues to being, uh, there has to be another way. I then called Steve Vines and uh, later Alex Hawke. My recollection was that they'd been saying they were talking to Scott and uh, pushing him that he should run if it came up. It's not uncommon when governments are going through difficult times that colleagues will talk about what those difficulties are and what we're facing. Um, but at that time, I had just been made social services minister and I knew it, I had an important job because this is what Tony had asked me to do, to join the economic team of the government, that you know we had a job to do in the next budget to turn things around. So that's what I went and did. I, Scott John Morrison, do swear that I will well and truly serve the people of Australia in the office of the Minister for Social Services. This system will pay for itself by giving those who work in our system to crack down on welfare fraud the sort of tools they need to be an effective welfare cop on the beat. RoboDebt was a catastrophic failure in policy and delivery. Victims were sacrificed on the altar of a surplus. We're going after the cheats, Mr Deputy Speaker, and we're going to stop those cheats and we're going to stop those rorters. This will deliver $1.7 billion in gross savings returned to the government. The onus of proof had been reversed. Then you had to prove, you had to prove that you were not a fraud. It lacked compassion for the vulnerable. Jennifer Miller's son, Reese took his life after being chased by debt collectors claiming he owed almost $18,000 to Centrelink. She was one of many to give evidence as part Reese was in a real state. Like, how can I even prove that I don't actually owe any money? And RoboDebt was the straw that broke his back. It really was. I'll never get over it. Good evening. The final report into the robo-debt scheme is scathing. Scott Morrison is among those being slammed. And what would you say to the people whose lives were affected by robo-debt? Well, the policy decisions you make from time to time won't go as you had intended them to. And so you didn't want to cause harm to anyone. If we had been advised by the department that they had legal advice which said this was not lawful, it would never have been taken forward.
So there was a very rapid sequence of events uh, in early 2015. There was the Prince Philip knighthood on Australia Day, the 26th of January. Only five days later, uh, there was the Queensland state election in which a first term government with a huge majority lost the election. My political career is over. It is over. The result has been described as catastrophic by some federal coalition MPs, with some claiming it has irreparably damaged Mr Abbott's hold on power. Is Tony Abbott the man to lead the uh, Liberals to the next federal election? Well, that's, uh, that's a discussion, isn't it? We need to look at where we're going. The Queensland election sent a shiver up the spine about what was coming for us unless we got our act together. The polls are terrible. Why? Because you're such a popular opposition leader. Why has the electorate lost faith in you as a prime minister? Koshi, I'm not looking at polls. I'm focused on what is going to do... And then only nine days after that, there was the empty chair spill. Did Tony Abbott know that there was trouble afoot? I'm not sure Tony Abbott fully understood the strength of the feeling in the party room. The idea that he had brought so many people into the parliament was delivering on everything. You know, surely nobody would be as foolish as to want to undermine the government. I did say to people internally, the Prime Minister's office and Tony, that I felt that there was movement at the station, so to speak, and that we should be prepared for that. Um, but I must admit, the Prime Minister's office didn't feel that was going to happen at all. It became concerning to myself that nobody was actually doing the numbers for the Prime Minister. And so I garnered the support of a few colleagues and we divided the parliamentary list. And uh, there was a particular name, Scott Morrison's, that was on my list. I had a discussion with uh, Mr Morrison, which I must say left me cold. Um, I, yeah, he, he professed his disinterest in what was happening. I said to him at the time, uh, Scott, we're talking about the prime ministership of our country. We are cabinet colleagues. How can you sort of pass this off as being of no real interest to you? I was getting phone calls from various, what you'd call, warlords from, from, from New South Wales who were pushing the need for, for Tony to, to go. There's no way that I would be receiving phone calls from those individuals in New South Wales unless they were doing that with the approval of their political master. It's as simple as that. And that master was Scott Morrison? I assume that their master is Scott Morrison. I don't run a faction in the Liberal Party. My colleagues, um, and they all made their own decisions. There was a lot of disgruntlement. And when you know, Don Randall um, and Luke Simpkins came forward out of the West, um, that brought that to a head. Have you uh, called for the spill motion against the PM? Uh, yes, I have called for the spill motion. The hand grenade lobbed after midday Eastern time from the West. WA Liberal MP Luke Simpkins emailed the entire Liberal parliamentary wing, saying he'd been flooded by complaints from his electorate since Australia Day. Uh, no, because this is what the uh, people uh, of my electorate want, and this is what the people of Australia want. Thanks very much. Well, you know, look, I... This is not exactly my style to call a spill motion, but... Uh, I was, I'd really sort of had enough at that point, and I'd probably also had enough with talk and no action. And so uh, I spoke to Tony and told him I was going to do it. Uh, and he said he wished I wouldn't do it. He said that it would damage the country. Uh, and I said, well, I think this has got to go to the party room for a judgment. And at this point, I didn't particularly want Malcolm as leader. First preference is Scott, but I call Scott Morrison and, uh, and he told me that he was definitely not going to run. We all said they are asking 
the party room to vote out the people that the electorate voted in in September 2013. We are not the Labor Party and we are not going to repeat the chaos and the instability of the Labor years. Malcolm was being told by people that he could win. And he rang me and said, what do you think? And I said, you don't have the numbers. You can only stick your hand up when you, we know that we've got the numbers. You know, one of my colleagues said to me, there's no need for you to do anything. Let him just burn down to the waterline. come as a surprise to many of us who, you know, in the party room and uh, this spill occurred. Um, it seemed to be quite ill-advised, particularly when there was an empty chair there. It was called an empty chair spill because the motion was simply to declare the position of leader vacant and there was no actual challenger. The empty chair was Malcolm Turnbull. Everyone knew that. It was, you know, a really weird mood in that room. The murmur of whispers, it was actually quite deafening. Donnie Randall, God bless his soul, there were no airs or graces with Don. He just got up and, and declared it on. So the whips do what they do, and uh, everyone's trying to sneak a look at what someone's writing on their paper. Can you believe it? Can you believe it? That my party, after all they've seen the Labor Party tear themselves to pieces and do, I'm watching them do exactly the same thing. The uh, whip stands to his feet and says, Tony Abbott's got 61 votes and the empty chair's got 39. There was a hush and there was a, a, a ghostly look. It was just awful uh, on the Prime Minister's face when those numbers were revealed to him. There was this stunned rabbit in the headlights um, response. He leant against the front of the desk and then he said, there will be change. There will be greater involvement. Backbenchers will be included. And I will listen. And I will make the changes that you've signalled that I need to make. All of us are determined to lift our game. And the fundamental point I make is that the solution to all of these things is good government. And good government starts today. Good government starts today. Look, that was, that was a terrible line, because uh, that was an admission that you had bad government before. The Prime Minister, Tony Abbott, made it very clear that uh, Peter Cradlin would be stepping back and that elected members would be stepping forward. And one way of doing this was having uh, regular meetings with cabinet ministers and backbench chairs of committees. Good idea, way of opening up those conversations. The first time we walk into this meeting, the person sitting at the table running the meeting is, of course, Peter Credlin. We've got a lot to discuss today, and uh, let's get down to business. Did you think then that the leadership rumblings were over? No. It was very clear Malcolm was on a mission. And it was all about Malcolm. A lot of people said Turnbull was actively undermining Abbott. Now, did it happen and how did it happen? Um, yes, it did. And there are times that I, in, in public in front of others, said directly to Turnbull's face, uh, I believe you're leaking to the press. I believe you've got a campaign that is working against 
Abbott. What did he say to that? Uh, you know, sort of, I suppose, a shrug. He would have seen a, you know, a, a minion, you know, squealing at him. <laughs> I don't recall Barnaby Joyce making those criticisms to me at that time at all. Uh, in fact, the leaks that were coming out of the Abbott cabinet were clearly coming from the Prime Minister's office. I think people on both sides of, you know, the loyalists of Abbott's and loyalists of Turnbull's leaked to prosecute um, their agendas. But nobody had any doubt that Malcolm was stalking Tony's leadership. There was a sense of blood on the water. The worm might be turning for the Abbott government. Its second budget is being well received and it's settled on... Prime Minister's prospects brightened today as he closed in on the opposition in news poll and resisted the urge to lead with his lip. I, I don't want to get into any more trouble. The coalition's primary vote is up three points to 41%. Labor's down two to 37. You know, there was a period of time where things settled down. OK, that's, that's dealt with now. Let's, let's get on with the job we were sent here to do or elected to do. It's a big week for trade, with Australia and China formally signing off a landmark free trade deal. This is a momentous day, an absolutely momentous, historic day for our two countries. I wouldn't have been able to do the negotiations and conclude things without the influence of Tony Abbott going and meeting with all of the leaders of the countries that we were doing deals with. And I want to state here what a good friend President Xi has been to this country. I think certainly the high point of our relationship with China was who was in the Abbott years. For Chinese people, it means more beef and better wine. <laughs> We'd turned the corner, I felt, and uh, I was looking forward to, you know, continuing on in that vein, and we get up into July, and it all changes. Tony Abbott was safe. He was locked in to lead the Liberal Party to the next election until Rowan Bishop took a helicopter for a flight. <laughs> Geelong's just down the road from Melbourne, about an hour in the car. But back in November, Rowan Bishop chartered a chopper to get to a Liberal Party fundraiser on time. The parliamentary Speaker Bronwyn Bishop has agreed to repay taxpayers the $5,000 she spent on a chartered helicopter flight. Uh, Bronwyn's uh, admitted uh, that it was uh, probably an error of judgment and uh, she's repaid the money. Hi, Bronwyn. How are you? Good to see you. Well, she was a great mate of Bronwyn's. Uh, she's done the right thing. Um, she's a good speaker. Uh, she has my confidence. He tried, he, you know, tried to push through like, like Abbott does. He tried to, you know, and that wasn't going to work because it was such a, an example of extravagance that the Australian people just don't like. Uh, when I saw the figure as it was published, it was clearly an error of judgment, and that's why I repaid it. I said to Tony, move Bronwyn on as uh, Speaker. She needs to be held accountable for this because it's an embarrassment to the government, uh, and none of us backbenchers need that sort of stuff happening. But uh, he didn't want to do it. She's been a good servant of our country, but like everyone who has done something like this, Inevitably, uh, for a period of time, they're on probation. So thank you. Thanks so much. He stuck by her and he stuck by her and he stuck by her, and the media kept on attacking and attacking and attacking. And there were cartoons and there were, you know, uh, you know comedy routines uh, continually uh, attacking Bronwyn, and eventually the pressure became too great. 
Thanks for coming. Uh, today, uh, Ms Bishop called me to let me know that uh, she would be resigning to the Governor-General from that particular position. It clearly had a, a very damaging impact, that whole saga, and, and, and sadly to Tony's detriment. Bronwyn Bishop and the helicopter flight destabilised the government, it destabilised Tony and allowed MPs and senators who did not have Tony's best interests at heart to start agitating again. It's a funny thing trying to gauge where people are thinking and there's there's a, a game of cat and mouse going on between me on one end of the phone and whoever it is on the other end of the phone. You can't flat out come out and say, Tony's got to go. It's normally something like, what are you thinking? People started to meet outside parliament and I think that that was then the start of a process of people saying, well, if things are not going to change, we're going to have to change them. In politics, when you're talking to people about voting, particularly uh, in leadership ballots, and I've been in a lot of them, the only person on whom you can completely rely is the one that looks you in the eye and says, I would rather cut off my right arm than vote for you, you bastard. That person you can definitely put down as a no. There was a good, strong number of people that Malcolm trusted implicitly, and they were the ones that were sitting around the table. Uh, Simon Birmingham, uh, Arthur Sinodinus, Wyatt Roy, uh, myself, Peter Hendy, and Alex Hawke did come into play along the journey. I can't remember where, but we relied on Alex to keep Scott in the loop. Are you worried at any point that Abbott's going to get wind of these weekly catch-ups in Canberra? Look, one of the amazing things was, and I think this is testament to the people that were making the calls and suggesting at the appropriate time to people, why don't you come and have a chat? We're gathering Sunday at Malcolm's unit. The understanding that we couldn't afford it to leak. And it didn't. Liberal MPs opposed to same-sex marriage are trying to head off a vote on the issue when Parliament resumes next month. The numbers in the Coalition Party room make the issue far from... One of the big galvanising, polarising issues in the Coalition had been the issue of same-sex marriage and whether it should be made legal. By 2015, the issue is very live. The Irish voted for it. The US Supreme Court ruled states couldn't ban it. Tony had adopted a particularly stubborn position on the issue. I am an opponent of gay marriage. I am an opponent of gay marriage. And he was manoeuvring in such a way as to thwart the issue. So I think it was f political folly uh, because his position was pretty fragile uh, at that point. We had an expectation that we would have a free vote, which had always been the Liberal Party's philosophy. And I encouraged Abbott to do that. Yeah. Warren Inch was, you know, a great advocate for legalising same-sex marriage, was trying to bring this issue to a head. A private member's bill to recognise gay marriage is set to be moved by Coalition MP Warren Inch and second... No, I mean, Tony, he wasn't keen. There's no question about it. But I did uh, I go and see him, and I think it was in the middle of August. One Sunday, I went and seen him, and I, I said to him, look, I can't wait any longer. I'd like to put it up next party meeting, which was on the Tuesday. He uh, said to me, look, I've got to, I'm going to have to talk to my Cabinet colleagues. And um, he said, but I'll let you know. 
Tuesday, and I got a communique from him. As you know, I'd prefer it never come up, but if it must, I suppose today's party room would be as good as any. Cheers, Tony. So there's, there's no ambiguity there. And it was on that basis that I stood up in the party room and introduced it, and the party room erupted. And there were many people that criticised me and said, why did you ambush the party room? And I said, I didn't. I said, I let the Prime Minister know and showed it to him. Well, I remember saying that we had not expected this to be brought on, and Warren took great exception to that, understandably, because as he showed me his text, he had actually told Tony, and so we did have notice of it, which surprised me. That was the end of it for me. You know, and he sat back there and allowed people to abuse me. And um, as far as I was concerned, I didn't believe that he deserved to be a Prime Minister after that. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Do you support a free vote on same-sex marriage? Look, uh, George Brandis, I'm sure, will give a briefing at the appropriate time about the uh, outcomes of the Liberal Party meeting. The meeting had been adjourned, but then, out of the blue, later in that day, Abbott called a joint meeting with the Nationals, which was wrong, because this was, this was an issue for the Liberal Party room. Christopher Pine actually accused him of branch stacking, effectively. I thought, well, this is not good, because we're now going to have a debate about marriage equality, the Nationals are here, and they shouldn't be here, and this should be a matter for us. As we go to air, Coalition MPs are meeting in Canberra to discuss the possibility of a free vote on same-sex marriage. But including National MPs in the policy discussion could favour the Coalition's Conservative core, slowing any momentum for change. It was wild. Everyone was giving speeches. It was a complete mess. At the time, I think I was the only openly gay member of the parliamentary party. Uh, I wonder if that registered with anyone in the room at the time. It was a difficult conversation to listen to. The disposition in the party room today uh, was that if there is to be change on a matter as sensitive as this, in the next term of parliament, we will put it to the people for the people to decide. The resolution of that meeting was a proposal that we would commit at the next election to having a, a plebiscite um, on the issue. Uh, this was a decision that was very unpopular uh, among most of the gay community. There is a, a, a serious risk that a plebiscite or a referendum in this country would be a green light to hate speech. Tony's handling of same-sex marriage was one of the issues that contributed to public disquiet as well as internal disquiet uh, and added to the problems that were already mounting up. There was growing momentum to replace Abbott from people who were not among my natural supporters. What was clear was this was not about one group within the Liberal Party or certain individuals within the Liberal Party. You had people who, um, you know, like James McGrath, who certainly comes from a different part of the party to me, who wanted to see the change. My view is that Tony who is a good and honourable and decent man who's given his life to public service, had switched off the voters. The party was heading towards electoral oblivion unless something happened. Sunday the 13th of September 2015, Tony, he was in Adelaide on his way back from Perth, I think. We had a 
gin and tonic at the Adelaide Club, as luck would have it. I'm sure I was frank with him that I thought things were troublesome. He was of the view that uh, it would be all right, we'd get back on track. So the last meeting of the gang that had been meeting for weeks and months to put this together was on Sunday the 13th of September. It was at Peter Hendy's house. His wife prepared a lovely dinner for us and we were essentially discussing what was going to happen in the following week. I walk in the door and uh, I look at Pete and he said, mate, do you want something to eat? And I said, oh, mate, that'd be fantastic. He goes, there's some tuna mornay there. Tuna mornay. I hate tuna. So I said to him, mate, you know what? I might order some pizzas as well. What about that? Didn't want to offend him, of course, but like, I just can't do tuna. There was a spreadsheet there which identified who was with Turnbull, who was against Turnbull, who may be undecided, who might need to be shored up. But the thing that, that struck me about that evening was that um, a lot of people had crossed the Rubicon. They were no longer sort of scared. Malcolm is normally, a, you know, a really confident, gregarious person. But I was watching him and as it became apparent that we had the numbers, he really went back into his shell. He got really quiet and nervous. Like, the, it was like the penny was dropping for him that this was now a go. I was always very aware of the gravity of the situation. If I succeeded, I'd be Prime Minister. If I didn't succeed, that'd be it. That'd be the end of my political career. But I, I felt I had a real chance. I, th I felt I had to give it my best shot. I sort of owed it. I, I just felt I owed it. I owed it to, the, to Australia. <laughs> that sounds very grandiose. But the truth is, this was a terrible government. It was decided that it was time that Malcolm gauge Matthias's view of the world. Uh, we were confident we knew Scott's view of the world. But Matthias would be very important for Malcolm moving forward if we were successful because he would need to look after the right flank for him. Corman, who, you know, had voted to depose me in 2009, was by this stage uh, supporting me uh, and helping, but being very low-key about it. Everybody knows where I stand supporting the Prime Minister. I've got no idea what others are up to. And... Scott was loudly proclaiming his loyalty to Tony Abbott and at the same time organising his supporters to vote for me. And, and we had an understanding that if I became Prime Minister, he would be Treasurer. No, I don't recall Malcolm offering me Treasurer before. I don't recall that. That's... I don't know where that's from. Um, I was not a protagonist in this. We decided that something needed to happen and that that week was the week that, that Malcolm would make the approach to Tony to say that he was challenging. It was decided that he would go around and see Tony after question time and all hell broke loose. Is a leadership challenge now inevitable? Well, I can't obviously provide commentary on uh, what you say is anonymous uh, commentary. What I can say uh, is that in my uh, judgment, uh, Tony Abbott uh, continues to enjoy uh, the strong and overwhelming support of the party room. Are there people plotting behind the scenes at the moment that you know of? I've got no idea, mate. Because, I mean, if they were, they wouldn't be talking to me. So after question time, I walked back to the Prime Minister's office with Abbott, sat down with him and said, look, I'm resigning from the Cabinet and I'm going to challenge you for the leadership. And then uh, he was shocked by this, told me I was mad, I'd lost my mind and so forth, and suggested I forget what we just discussed and go back to my office and pretend it hadn't happened, which I said was... that was unrealistic. And I 
walked out into the Senate courtyard and gave a short speech. Unlike me, it was a short one. OK. Well, thank you very much. Uh, a little while ago, I met with the Prime Minister and advised him that I would be challenging him for the leadership of the Liberal Party. The speech that he gave at that point, I think, was the best speech that he ever gave because he outlined very clearly why he was doing it and what he wanted to achieve. We need a different style of leadership. We need advocacy, not slogans. In politics, sometimes you make these statements that you live to regret. Now, if, if <laughs> generally there's quite a few of them. I said, but almost by way of a footnote, we have lost 30 news polls in a row. It is clear that the people have made up their mind about Mr Abbott's leadership. The 30 news poll reference came out of nowhere. No one knew about that. There was a classic Malcolm Turnbull line where he thought he was smarter than everybody else. I now have to go and speak to my colleagues. Thank you very much. Malcolm sent a benchmark that put a noose around his neck. Tony rang me to tell me that there was going to be a leadership challenge. Uh, I expressed disappointment about that. I think I also made the comment to him that um, have the members of parliament forgotten what Malcolm was like last time. The ABC understands Scott Morris. Matthias came round to my office and said, oh, Tony, I'd like to talk to you. And I said, sure. I mean, I got on well with Tony too. So I went round and, and he asked me if I wanted to sort of run as his, as his deputy. And I thought this was odd. <laughs> we already had a deputy, Julie Bishop. And as far as I knew, Julie wasn't going anywhere. <laughs> And I thought Jules was doing a good job. <laughs> so I went, well, I'm not going to challenge Julie. I went back to my office with a friend and I had a curry that night. <laughs> I went into the, the whip's office and, uh, you know, and Scotty Buckholz was the whip at the time and he's, he's drawn a line up on a piece of paper and said, oh, which side are you on, Craig? I've just looked at him and I've gone, kidding. You're asking me now which side I'm on? You know which side I'm on. And if you're only trying to work this out now, it's too late, it's all over. I think Tony's Praetorian guard in that respect let him down. My wife was gravely ill and uh, so I didn't have the finger on the pulse as I did previously and when I realised what was happening, there were certain colleagues that I tried to ring and uh, they were unavailable. All sorts of excuses and uh, I saw the writing on the wall. If someone's in trouble, you get in and you support them. And I didn't see that. I saw Tony deserted. Do you believe Tony Abbott's leadership is safe? Well, I think there's enough speculation around. I don't think I need to add to it. But it happened very quickly. So within the space of uh, a few hours, we were all being called in to vote. That's what we'll find out. For me, it was very clear you support the leader. And I walked with our supporters uh, into the party room. It sort of felt like going to battle. It was liberating, because we were out there in public as opposed to speaking privately among ourselves. We were out there nailing our colours to the mast, for good or bad. And off we go. Tony declares the position vacant. The whip asks for candidates. Uh, Tony and Malcolm stand up. I voted for Turnbull because there was no other option. I was loyal to Tony Abbott. I supported his prime ministership. 
I voted for Tony Abbott. But I, you know, I was bereft of choices. So many things about Malcolm that I, I couldn't really go with, but, you know, in the end, um, there wasn't anyone else, really. You win 54 to 44. How do you feel? Well, I was... I was a little stunned, uh, but I felt very good about it. I mean, to quote Abbott, I felt good government could begin today because I was confident that I would run a good government. Obviously, Tony was very unhappy about it. Uh, he didn't shake Malcolm's hand to congratulate him. It was tense for a moment, and then the party room dispersed. The Australian people chose Tony Abbott and I believe when our party rolled Tony Abbott, the democracy went out the door that day. Very good. Thank you all very much. I'm, uh, uh, Julie and I are sorry to keep you up uh, so late. Uh, this has been a very important day in the life of the nation, the government, and of course of our party. Tony played a, a pretty good poker face. You know, I, I was invited back to have a drink with him in his office. You know, there was a lot of uh, very angry people. How was he? But shattered, but not not bawling or anything like that. But you know, just a person who felt that he'd just been hit in the head with a 4B2. Tony Abbott's only the fourth Liberal leader to take the party to government in its history. How's he feeling? Gutted. Still not believing that it really happened. Some people that he thought were close confidants were continuing to bolster him up in private and stab him in the back. Can you say who it is? Oh, look, uh, my, my uh, view is that Christopher Pine and Senator George Brandis uh, were uh, thick as thieves in that and uh, pursued that. Did you have an idea of what was going on? No. I wasn't involved in Malcolm Turnbull's campaign against Tony Abbott. And I felt personally very conflicted as someone who had continued to support him until literally that very morning. Um, I did go to see Tony and we had a, a tense meeting uh, in, which, uh, but in which I said I wanted to come and see you to explain why I didn't vote for you. And I was honest with him because in my view, it was all over for him. He wasn't going to stop the Turnbull ascension. Now, the hour is very late. Everyone should go to bed. Thank you very much indeed. Cheer up. Quite a crowd today. Thank you for being here. Uh, this is not an easy day for many people in this building. Leadership changes are never easy for our country. Uh, my pledge today is to make this change as easy as I can. There will be no wrecking, no undermining and no sniping. I understood very well how devastated Abbott would be after losing the leadership. It is humbling to lose, but that does not compare to the honour of being asked to lead. Thank you. So I did reach out to Abbott to see how he was going. He didn't welcome my inquiries. What did he say? He generally told me to fuck off. 
He had quite a few variations on that. You and Malcolm have blood on your hands this morning. Huh? That's the phrase that people use. I've found this a very difficult um, decision to take. It's fair to say that you win at that point in time and there's the euphoria of having done it, the fact that we think, hey, let's get this show back on the road. But what you don't appreciate is the depth of anger of some of those in the room and the lengths they will go to as time moves forward to exact revenge and retribution. When you're so focused on one thing, and that is blind ambition and ego, uh, you don't really think about the, you know, the, the consequences that unfold. And one of them is that, you know, you reap what you sow. Malcolm Turnbull looked like the moderate's dream. He was the smaller Liberal, but Malcolm, at some point, made effectively a Faustian bargain uh, with some of the leaders of the right wing of the party, uh, that they would stay off his back and he would give them what they wanted. And that was a major mistake. Because after what the right wing of the party saw as the political assassination of their hero, Tony Abbott, There is no way the right wing were ever going to forgive Malcolm. I, Malcolm Blighter, do swear that I will well and truly serve the people of Australia in the office of Prime Minister. If you take by the sword, you die by the sword. Congratulations, Prime Minister. Prime Minister needs strong lieutenants or you don't survive. Tony Abbott whacks him on the knee as if away you go. And I thought, oh, surely not. It unleashed a lot of blood. Good old fashioned knives in the back or the front. We could hear laughing and cursing about this person or that person. Malcolm Turnbull blew himself up. He was a friend. Maybe one day we will be again. Is there a good Malcolm and a bad Malcolm? There's only one me. <laughs> Nemesis, next Monday at 8, ABC TV and ABC iView.